uh, and thank you, Professor uh, Carol, for uh, letting me try this workshop. And actually, thank you, uh, Professor Solrat, uh, so who has invited me for joining this workshop. Uh, so actually, uh, Professor Solrat uh, invited my uh, seniors, uh, Professor of Clinical Geneticist at, at the Faculty of Medicine, Jalalongkorn, uh, but he cannot join this one, so uh, uh, kind of the replacement. <laughs> uh, anyway, so uh, I'm, what I'm going to present here is uh, the perspective on more on the ethical sides uh, as a medical geneticist, and as we know that the germline editing technologies become feasible in the recent years, that make us kind of, you know, have a lot of concerns what it can do, what it cannot, and it uh, might threaten some of our belief or, you know, as the future of humanity or something like that. But uh, as a medical geneticist, I, I'm going to say that my view probably going to be a bit narrow, more scientific, and uh, a little bit, you know, pragmatic of what I can see during the day and what I should do when I see patients or anyone come to find me to, to get their opinion. Uh, so you see, uh, you know, conflict of interest here. And uh, as I said, the ideas here not represent any consensus agreement or policy of any organizations unless specified. And to give you a background so you know what I'm doing and why I'm thinking like that, something like that. So I'm a medical doctor, so I graduated uh, 18 years ago, worked as a doctor and trained in medicine and genetics in uh, several places. I just come back to Thailand uh, two years uh, and worked at the genetic department in the medi uh, internal medicine department. So, uh, so basically, like geneticists work as a clinician's work mainly in the pediatric department and some of geneticists like work in the reproductive uh, technologies department like the obstetricians so very few geneticists will work uh, full time in the adult patient setting so my patients is uh, coming for seeking the diagnosis or they're suspicious that they have the genetic diagnosis and get mainly for the genetic test for having the diagnosis and go on for the prognosis of the treatment. And also some families seeking the genetic explanation uh, maybe for their reproductive planning or other things what they think about. And my setting of working is in the public university hospital so across the street at the King Jolongkong Memorial Hospital. Uh, so it's a, one of the biggest hospital in Thailand. We have, uh, you know, millions of patients come today, but I can only see like 700 patients a year uh, as a single geneticist in, in the de Department of Medicine. Also a consultant in some private hospitals, so that's a good thing so that I can see patients from more, you know, wide uh, demographic background. And then we're going to talk about, you know, that cultural, that ethnic background, or that belief might affect our thinking of our practice in terms of the genetics. So most of the patients are Thai, obviously, but many from Southeast Asians, Burmese, Cambodian, uh, and uh, in the reproductive setting, interestingly, like a lot of Chinese uh, patients or couples come for getting the uh, counseling. And I, I see a lot of Middle Eastern uh, patients which they have some strong cultural belief and something that, you know, as a clinician, you, are, you, you cannot actually know all the cultures or all that belief and you have to be very careful when talking with them. Uh, South Asia is very cultural, rich, and, you know, I, I consider it's very challenging when talking or counseling patients from South Asians. But I, I, I also saw patients from, uh, you know, all, all other countries and, you know, one of the principles of the genetic counseling is uh, to be non-directive. You cannot really say that what, should, what you should do this, what you should do that, which is kind of a medical practice model, I think, 30 years, 40 years ago, that you really patronize it, you 
you know how the patient needs to listen to you. But, uh, it's not that bad now today, but still some doctors still practice that kind of paternalistic things like I know that you should listen to me. But in genetic counseling, especially people trained uh, from European countries or the US because of some historical background, we really careful about giving that, you know, directions to the patients. Um, I think I will show some of this historical background that uh, I think it's it makes us as a community, as a global community, think about genetics very differently from you know the past 40 years, uh, 50 years ago. So it's uh, I cannot say that it all starts from these uh, physicians, but Galton is the first one who coined the term eugenics. And as we know that he did a lot of uh, anthropometric uh, measurements. And he's one of the biomet biometrical geneticists, which is actually uh, more like a polygenic trait rather than Mendelian traits. Uh, to, for, to your surprise, this kind of service doing the fingerprinting to tell what your kids uh, will be good at is still practiced in Thailand. So it's, but as we know that these kind of trade, these kinds of, you know, some phenotypic measurement is not even accuracy, I, I would say that it's part to the astrology. But it's still practiced and very expensive and many couples go there to get these kind of tests. So, uh, I think it's not showing this one. Uh, okay. Alright, never mind. So, actually, there's a PDF file uh, that talking about a little bit about the, the eugenics. But as you most uh, familiar with the eugenic terms, and then it's come to very extreme in terms of the, you know, the negative eugenics and you know, as a World War II break out and then all the communities really, you know, concerns about it's going to be like, you know, anything to do with the gene, anything to do with the race. Uh, so that's why, that's a historical background that make most of the current medical geneticists or, you know, in the genetic counseling setting be really careful not to touch on what we should do, but uh, let them get the information and let them think about what to do. So, about the germline editing, it's actually not really a new idea or new concept or new thinking, but why now, like, as we hear uh, in Bangkok during the, you know, very heavy pollution out there to discuss about this serious matter, so we understand genetic uh, molecularity and can modify genes or genome for more than three decades, uh, mostly in the animal for, for sure, but until recently that the genome editing tools become more effective and close to be used in the clinic. How close, we don't know, but at least we see, you know, at least healthy baby claim to be genetic modified in front of us in the news. And I think case of Dr. Her, uh, Virgin Gui, uh, in Sun Chen, provokes our fear at most now that what it can be done. Okay, even like, you know, with the regulations, with the people talking about that, some people still break the rules and doing that. So the germline editing uh, is something like a cloning technology that come out, you know, in the last decade that, you know, provoke our thought, our discussions, mainly like, you know, the, the benefits, the harms, even for the patients as a clinicians, even for the society. So we're not going to see these cloning comes very, uh, very soon. But as someone already talked about, we already have animals that are coming from cloning a lot of things. Why not human? Uh, we have discussions about the gene modifications in other organisms, especially for food, for our cultural, it's going to be marketing plan or whatever, it's going to solve the global uh, <coughs> anchor or not. 
but it's also about the evolution that someone really care about, like as a human, as a species, or whatever. Uh, but what I will say a little bit more about the gene modification, many, many, many times we, we emphasize that this can do with the inheritable diseases, uh, especially the somatic gene, gene editing or somatic gene therapy, like, you know, on the first day, of, uh, Professor Surade Hong who involved in the you know somatic uh, genome editing therapy for thalassemia, very common uh, inherited disease in our area. Uh, it actually can do for non-inheritable disease as well, and, and you know the gene therapy clinical trials very active in the field of cancer and HIV. So it also can have put a lot of potentials to do good for in terms of the medicine or medical. Disease. But as we're talking about when it's touched more and more and it's more sensitive, it, it shows like can we do the germline testing? It's now like many people start to fear and not sure what exactly it is. And actually that that probably the public idea make most of them actually don't know what it is. And it's you know it's very Difficult or sensitive to like do the polls like that in in the time of you know the social media spread all the news and it, it's kind of you know massive hysteria nothing like that. Uh, so sometimes it halt the you know the progress of something of something might be good. I'm gonna talk about some some of the history about the IVF. It's also create something like this, but in that time you know. Uh, you're not going to see this issue until it's come out in the public issues, uh, talking at the government sectors on the TV, like the BBCs. But nowadays, you know, if you're talking something about this, just go out in the Facebook, Twitters, one night. It's it's a lot of thing to do. Okay, and everyone now know about the somatic and germline. Uh, what's the difference in terms of the techniques? But it's more, much more different in terms of the, you know, the, the impact on the ethicals, on the socials, or on the medical. That's why we, we, we here to, to talk about that. Uh, as I mentioned before, that as a medical uh, field perspective, it's actually more, much, we, much, we, we really focus on the biological model. So sometimes we speak all these kind of humanity, social issues. As someone said that, you know, most of the things that we should do, it should be social justice or social equity. But sometimes as a pragmatic, as a clinician, and you know, the, your patients at hand, and you have to be like patients advocates. It's not almost always congruent with the social justice, social equity. But that's a lot of things um, going on. So this picture is a, uh, Another thing is that we talk about that stem cell. This is this amounts that all the tissues uh, coming from induced pluripotential stem cells. So it, basically, it's a cloning. It's not really involved with the embryo creation, but with the technique that they have now, they have still to to inject the IPSC into the, the you know the blastocyst, which actually have to you know come with the embryo. So the embryo site or the status of the embryo as you know this is an animal is it or as a human embryo what's the status what's the right of it? Uh, there's a lot of you know talk about. So hopefully it's gonna cap. So anyone saw or heard about this movie Baby Steps? So we, we mentioned a little bit about you know the surrogates and uh, you know the same sex couples. So this uh, this is a very good movie to to see. So it's a uh, same sex couples live in in the U.S. but one 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 uh, partner is a Taiwanese. So he's a Taiwanese. As a Taiwanese, uh, as a Chinese. Uh, that sense, there's a lot of cultural issues and you know a lot of family expectations about having uh, babies about that and most of them still not really open to these same sex uh, couples. But this also involves a lot of you know the IVF uh, thing, the surrogate uh, matter. 
this movie actually comes out, you know, I think a couple, only a couple months before Thailand Parliament passed the act to prohibit these kind of technology for a non-relative surrogate mother. So now today, if we want to do the, you know, have the surrogates mothers, they have to be relative. And actually the couples have to be legally married. So no longer, you know, same-sex couples or homosexual friendly in Thailand anymore for this specific issue. Um, this is the clip. Uh, this is yeah, this is the clinic in Thailand because they they come to to get these uh, things done in Thailand. So so this movie is kind of uh, make me interest in the issues. It's very good movie to 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 watch in terms of what's the uh, impact of these specific issues. Uh, just to give you a. Um, and ideas. Many of you already probably know that, but I want you to know about the scales of the problem. Like as we talk about, you know, do the germline editing is very expensive tools. Even get the IVF baby is very expensive, but how many children now today in the world are sitting in, in front of you? Maybe, you know, I mean, one of your students, one of your researchers, one of your colleagues might come in from IVF. So there's now 5 million IVF babies worldwide from the estimate, probably underestimate. And the business part, you know, and in the US only, it's a growing, you know, growing business. 100 million US dollars business. And we talk about the pre-implantation uh, pre genetic diagnosis, it also comes along with this IVF. Okay. So, uh, we talk a lot about these gene uh, editing or genome engineering. So basically, I, I would you know just use it as a group of technologies that do do that work, like a molecular scissors and molecular glues that work like a magic. You know, you know, people think that it's a magic, but uh, sometimes they have some you know uh, off uh, site very non-specific and that creates some harms and people talk a lot about already about the therapeutic you know use which can use for a genetic disease or for reproductive some people think about infertile as a you know medical issues but we not talk about this much in you know 20 years ago like the IV when the first idea of baby born or as many bioethicists or social concerns about the enhancement, like in, a, in her case that uh, the HIV resistant is actually enhanced. Uh, so that's why it's hard to swallow at this time that you use an immature technologies and risk the couples, risk the babies. And, and a lot more than that in the investigation of her case, that very interesting how it's going to look like. When we talk about the intelligent physical strain, nutritional requirement, or lifespan. But again, we talk about the DNA or deterministic power, which is not perfect. So are we able to do what we think about? And does this really impact us in that way? And another thing else, like, you know, it's not really custom made, but it's just the preference. Like, you know, the gender selection is a really deep, you know, moral, ethical issues. It's practice, it's still in the practice, but we, we know that it's really concerns a lot like, you know, maybe that's another big topic to talk, discuss about. And everyone know about this her case already. Um, uh, just keep it in here, like when people in Thailand heard about something coming from China, especially from these city, Sanjun cities, it's actually kind of a we stereotype the city as a city of, you know, make everything as a, you know, very good copy, okay? So when we talk about Sunjin, we always joke about it. it's not going to be true. But now today we know that the biggest genome factory in the world that sequence half of the, you know, DNA sequencing in the world is actually in Sunjin. So they, they do have real technology. But we always, you know, concern when we talk about China is that 
they have less regulations other than other countries what they do is real or not real so like the first the first thing first when we when 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 we saw this news like her case like you know and as as you mentioned that it's not even published yet but even it's published when I mean, come from china when you 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 read china and chinese name so my parents from china and um, i can read some chinese and i i um, i have fun reading chinese name to non-chinese people because it, the the you know the transcription of the, the you know the, the phonetic is really trouble people right but yeah, anyway, that's off topic. But the thing is, when it's coming from China, we always, you know, have some suspicious on that. But it seems like he's a, he's a, you know, a real scientist. And he works on his issues. But, you know, to, to put something under the, the, the cover, under the carpet, is something that we cannot uh, verify at the moment. And we talk about the eugenics a little bit about. So, uh, in the next, uh, 10 slides or something. I extract some words from this book, so this is not coming from my, my mouth. Uh, some of you might know Gregory Stock, he's a biotechnologist and own a, you know, big tech companies. So he's not a bioethicist himself, but he talked a lot about this. And he read, uh, wrote a book that surveyed the idea about redesigning humans or you know, basically the German identity. At that time, in 2003, it's very you know new because no one know about CRISPR Cas9 yet. But most of the idea there uh, is still I think it's still up to date and it's still the, the same themes that we discuss now today. So I, I extract some words from this. But the the whole themes of the book when I read this, it's he's very secular in terms of thinking. So it's not going to touch more on you know the theologies or uh, religious belief and mainly he's kind of you know say that there are some religious concerns out there but most most of the most of the time he will counter argue about these uh, theological belief uh, some quotes that I think words mentioned many many of you I mean knows James James Watson right the Nobel Prize uh, right who proposed the model of double helix He's always getting into trouble when he talks in the public because he's a very opinionated scientist and not all his thinking, you know, come along with, with the people and he, he always makes people furious when he talks about, like sometimes he talks about black uh, African people less intelligent than white and he's get you know, escort back to the airport, going back to the U.S. He's, no one uh, welcome you to talk. And one time we talk about this issue, and I'm not surprised about James Watson talk like this. He said, no one really has the guts to say it, but if you could make better human beings by knowing how to add genes, why shouldn't we? That the talk in 1998. But as a bioethicist like Leon Cass, uh, he said that we should never apply germline gene intervention to human beings. The breeding of mankind would be a social nightmare from which no one could escape. But that was 20 years ago. Um, some fear of that, they talk about these can reduce genetic diversity, but it's not going to be true unless we you know, clone the humans. Um, anyway, the humans still escape from, from the genetic manipulations. Uh, one of the shows that uh, show the evolutionary powers of the genetics like you know in the Jurassic Park we, we think that we can control everything but they continue to evolve as well as the human genomes it's continue to evolve even we manipulate we just only can do a very little part of that can it lead to cluster of genetically enhanced superhumans can we consider these twins superhumans Less, you know, become less infected with the HIV. No one knows yet. Uh, the book setting the stage start from the Gelsinger case. So uh, this is a case uh, with the uh, immune deficiencies who died from the gene therapy in 1999. Since 
when this news comes out, the gene therapy community nearly have to shut down that, that program because uh, this kid considers pretty healthy, but he died from 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 the gene therapy. But at that time, they used the, you, you, the, the virus vector that created a lot of immune reactions. Uh, only until the recent years, like in the last couple of years, that clinical trials of the gene therapy become more uh, control regulated and more, become more effective. But at that time, you know, as you know, that the somatic gene therapy, which was less regulated at that time, uh, have really slow progress. You know, in the last 10 years, we're not talking more about gene therapy until recently. So, if we're gonna do the same thing with the germline genetic modification like Hurl's case, um, and then we have to wait and see when it's gonna come into practice, we'll probably, and we have to wait for you know another two decades. Is that safe? Is that really benefit the Humankind, we will see. There are some ethics and ideology that he uh, he wrote in the book, like as we discussed, like you know something like why should we play God, uh, or some rigid dogma in the Catholic Church. We're not gonna you know compromise with any IVF technology. What no matter what we do, no matter what we talk, they start from you cannot get the sperm without conceive that you know in the marriage so no no more discussion right so we can't argue that when they have this really rigid dogma but anyhow as we know if we even able to balance all these things but it won't keep them from spreading you know people really want to do what they want to do like you know they go underground uh, the stem cell therapy not coming out in the clinical trials, but we have a really big, nice, you know, like a five-star luxury center in Thailand that people fl fly away from every country to get a fake stem cell therapy treatment. So people can do whatever they want to do. If it's real or not real, we can totally ban them. Okay, they will sneak out. Many people are talking about many agencies like UNESCO, Council of Europe, or you know, these people talking about like as we mentioned about the human dignities, which are I mean pretty vague term for me. Um, I I don't really know what it means. Uh, I mean I know in some narrow sense of that, but does it make any sense in when you practice this? And it's changed from time to time. Uh, there's another movie, I have a lot of movies here. Uh, my, many people might watch these Netflix original series called The Alter Common. It's not a genetics modification, but it's a technology that you can transfer like the, the conscious into a, a machine and, a, a, and you can plug into the spinal cord. It's very imaginary. But the thing is, you know, uh, one thing of this uh, specific movie is it's create a lot of social uh, inequities like only rich people can do this um, so basically you know the rich people if they want to reborn they just you know check out the machine reload to the new new body that they can buy or clone from someone else or they can get the body from you know stocks frozen stuff or whatever so it's pretty scary if it's become real, but it's, as we know, most of the movie is very exaggerated, and we're probably not gonna close to this one, but I think it's interesting to see this kind of movie. Anyway, um, some of the discussions, like why do we really care when we talk about the germline, everything? When we, now today, no, I don't think that any parents will argue against if the doctor said that you can do the heart surgery in the womb, right? But if we can change the genetic material in the babies, in the fetus, or in the embryo, why do we really care about that if it's for therapy, therapy point of view? So many people will probably gonna say yes, 
if the technology become mature, right? Uh, but uh, I mean, how efficient of these techniques? Like how many embryos that you have to create until you get a good, good embryo that you you know edit the genomes and put it in back end, and what to do with the the rest of the embryo? That's always the concern when you talk about the embryo research. And that's, that's just when we're talking about the therapy, therapeutic point of view. But when we talk about the germline enhancement, many people will, talk, will say that it's morally wrong. We don't have right to, to alter genes. That's the, you know, the, the humans as a species, uh, things from God, something like that. So, and as we talk about also the destroying embryos, there's a, some, some some issues that I found it interesting. Uh, like when you talk about when the personhood onset from a, you know, different theological debates, uh, there's no single agreement on that. Like uh, someone can correct me if I, I, I actually quote from the book. Like many, many religious, even the Buddhists which uh, most of the scholars consider it an atheist. We're still talking about soul, right? So, uh, like the I'm in soul state and then the end soul state. Like Catholics said, the end soul, the end soul state start from the conception. Judaism said that it start from a month after conception. Muslims said that somewhere between one and three months. It's very interesting to see these uh, different ideas and. Most of them are going to become metaphysical uh, argument when we talk about that. Even in Buddhist, uh, from the script, Trapitika, it said that it's within the first week, so there is no single agreement. Even in the scientific secular trends, like the many the countries' law or regulation on embryo research, including the recent acts come out from Thailand, we said that every three days or 14 days, or presence of the neural tube, which one first, then you have to destroy the embryo because if they said that, you know, there are some scientific things at least objectively see that it might be a soul already or we, we match the, the soul and the neural system or the nervous system. I don't know which one is true and it's 40 days, it's still good nowadays. If we freeze the 14 days for embryo research, how can this happen in her case, right? But if we too much careful or cautious on this issue and we keep these 14 days locking, when we're gonna have a real germ, germ like editing for goods, if it's gonna become that. So that's, that's an, I, something that I'm really confused and perplexed on that. Okay. There's another uh, movie series, right? Most of you will know that. This is something that comes out, I think it's 1996 or something like that. Anyone familiar with this movie? What do you call it? Sorry? A, G, C, T, and it's rearranged into Gataka, right? This movie, Gataka, is really something that, that, you know, they say that all the geneticists choose to watch this movie. It's very, you know, thought-provoking, like how can the genetic discrimination in the workplace really take place when the technology becomes feasible? So this guy, Ethan Hawk, uh, has a genetic inferiority because he cannot achieve the genetic test. They're not even talking about the genetic modification at that time, but they try to select the genetic superior embryo. But this family, they cannot do that. They can, can't, couldn't afford when, when the first child born. But then finally they know that he has some, uh, when they did the genetic profile, they said that he's gonna have lifespan of like 30 years and become having heart attack or something like that. For, so for the second baby, they choose to do the genetic selections of the second baby. 
But this will be trying to say that at the end, if you practice and you overcome the genetic capacity, he's become actually more fit than his uh, younger brothers. Uh, this, uh, okay. Another movie. So, X Men series is my favorite. You know, as a geneticist, you try. You, you watch these movies with interest that there's a lot of, you know, the genetic isolation, social isolation, genetic discrimination, social uh, concern, public fear, how bad it is to be that, or evolutionary powers. In these uh, trilogies, this, this uh, the last stand in 2006, talking about that, if you can kill the superhuman power, are you gonna do that, right? Is that something uh, that we're going to do for these germline editings and it can be inherited? All right. So, start from 2015, that her group start to do this human, you know, the germline editing, but in the leftover embryo. So, these embryos are not, not going to become real because of they have three nucleus in the cycles. Normal cycle will have two, two uh, pronuclei from the sperm and the eggs and fuse into one nucleus. But this is tripronuclear cycle, so it's not going to become uh, achieve you know, the embryo state. Uh, at best, it's going to become like a you know, complicated pregnancy. It's called molar pregnancy, so it's not going to become baby. And, but they did modify the germline using these you know, well-known CRISPR-Cas9 editing to, to help with these uh, leftover cy uh, cycles. They're going to become thalassemic patient if it's become thalassemia. But they just correct one of the copies. Because of this, this genetic disease, uh, it's called recessive disorder. You have to have both copies uh, defect. But if you can change just one, it's enough. So we're not really fear about the, the, the terms called the mosaic system because if we can help a little bit of that, it should be fine. So finally, when these papers come out, there are a lot of discussion, but finally, most of the bioethicists still can follow this issue because these embryos are not gonna go up as a human. This is the environment in 2015 that in many countries still ban doing the embryo research or doing the germline editing. We don't know much about Russian Federation. We don't know much about Latin America. Many people in Africa, they have their own issues. They're not talking about that. After that 2015 papers, there are few, a couple more papers try to see that if technology is really benefit or are there any side effect on those. Uh, 2017, they correct the embryo that going to become uh, the, having the heart condition called the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can be severe in some kids, but most of them actually going to present their symptoms in the adult, like in 20, 30 or later than that. And again, they, they said that it's in create uh, some, some embryos are genetic corrected, some embryos are more sexism, some embryos are not corrected at all. So, uh, but they destroyed the embryo after 14 days. So again, we still said that it's in the ethical rounds, still okay for doing that. And in 2017, the American Society of Human Genetics, which have like 10,000 uh, members, uh, always you know, give a status update on the genetic issues. At that time, they said that Given the nature and number of unanswered scientific, ethical, and policy questions, it is inappropriate to perform germline gene editing that culminates in human pregnancy. Uh, currently, there, but currently there is no reason to private in vitro germline genome editing on human on human embryos and gametes with appropriate oversight and consent from donors to facilitate research. Right? We know that it's in the research on the possibility of future clinical application. So this become social justice when we talk about clinical justification. Um, 
It should be evidence-based. It should have medical rationale. But it's it's pretty vague, and it's uh, it depends on how you interpret it. But one thing is, it should be transparent public process to solicit and incorporate stakeholder input. Everyone should talk about that, which happened before in the case of IVF. We we'll talk about that. And it actually the same idea with the, uh, the previous presenter talk about the international summit on human genome editing in 2018. But then the nightmares becomes real at the end of 2018 that China scientists claim 12 first gene edited babies. But at the top, like after that, he's become house arrested and become under investigation. And we don't know that it's really just the political issues to cover anything, but at least from the pre preliminary uh, investigation, they said that Hurst fraud all the IRB papers and doing everything, you know, without trying to, you know, escape from that and raise the public fund without, you know, close supervisions. But uh, I don't know what actually the real story. We need some time to see. Why in the case of Robert Edwards, who is the father of IVF babies, so much different in her gene group? But actually, we forget that at that time, Robert Edwards also had some hits or a lot of comments from the communities at that time. And especially at that time, you know, even in England, which, you know, uh, have more Protestants, also some, a few Catholics in that, at that time, but still a lot of social discussions. But what's the difference between these two cases? Because Robert step every step very slowly, very cautiously. He started research pro research program to encourage the public discussion and the social discussion until at that time the you know the MRC of UK allowed him and grant him the fund to start doing this as a research and progress to clinical point of view. Because he's very concerned about what it should be done and what it should not be in it. It, it, it brings the social force into the justice. But it still takes like 10 or 20 years until we first successful, you know, get the first uh, idea of baby bonds or Louis Brown, which is in her uh, <coughs> 40s now. So, but can we do the polls like this now in 2019? As we mentioned, like, her case come out only a, a couple months the social or the public or, or the scientists who should know, we, we thought the scientists should know about this. But they swing back from more supportive into the become less restrict, become less restrictive in terms of that. If we do this to the public, which uh, we mostly agree that the genetic literacy is generally low in the public, does that or should that be counted as a, you know, a justice that the public said that it's okay or not okay to do this. Should we listen to that? So it's, it's really difficult to judge at this time. From a hero become an irresponsible researcher in a couple of hours of heart. So that's a nightmare. And as, you said, as I said, uh, probably you, you read the new article that Guangdong released the preliminary investigation result of these gene edited babies. And most of them said that the, 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 all the papers kind of uh, fraud. And as I said, like, is it time to amend the human embryo research of the 14 day rule? Is this a strict rule? Should we do more? Have we done enough in the primates, in the animal study, to start doing this in the human? And before this talk, as a, uh, we have the comments about this genetic profiling. We have to, to make sure the genetic determinism is not perfect. I just bought two books at the same time. And it is interesting to see that, you know, the geneticists have such a, you know, different ideas in terms of the genetic determinism. This guy is a behavioral psychologist. Uh, he done a lot of work in genetics in twins, and he wrote a book, Blueprint. He really strongly believed that DNA make us who we are. But actually, when you read the books, you will see that it's in a population level. It's a population scale. He not even mentioned that you should do that in the clinic, right? 
we, we cannot do the genome profiling and tell the difference between that. But the book, the title of the book is pretty misleading. But these guys uh, say it's more cautiously, like the DNA is not destiny. We have to know the limitations of that. And this is a genome profile news uh, that uh, come out. Uh, it's not, the sound's not, I, I did not uh, connect the sounds. But basically, this reporter said that in Singapore, uh, as, a, you, as you might know, the Singapore is considered a very hard working, very, you know, uh, family oriented. Um, this is a uh, couple that they want to know how, why these kids have really bad allergy in the house. Ironically, the dad is a smoker and he smoked in the house. But he said that he stopped smoking when he did the genetic profile in the kids and said that, oh, he's really allergic. Like, why do we need to do the genetic profile to know the harmful or bad effect of the smoking in the household? So, I don't know, but that's the marketing that they're coming out. Um, this book is also very popular, right? But again, this book is the, the, the idea is they talk more about how the data driven in uh, society is going to become. They're not talking a lot about the genome editing uh, in the large scales and then basically it failed to predict the first created twin superhumans so I'm conquered by it. HIV kids. Um, so we don't know what's going on. The technical feasibility is not an issue in the wrong way. Some people will do that and some people can achieve that, you know, what we call effective, what we call safe, at some point of the, you know, the time scales. The le legislation and the regulation, if it's come out from the fear and we come, we banning all or the or eliminate all or the prevent uses of these so-called technologies, someone gonna do that. Anyway, Dr. Hurst is the showcase. We're not gonna stop discuss about the ethical, social implication, philosophical, ethical, religious, and social discussion in dis disrupting technology. At some point, as a medical geneticist, we might not no longer have work to do if all the people have been cured with the, these genetic tools. But that's why we call it the disrupting technology. As a medical personnel, um, I still think positively and encourage if we do research transparently to facilitate to and pro produce a lot of evidence base of this research and to this to become useful in the clinical use. No matter what, someone gonna abuse the technology. We cannot argue that it's it's uh, susceptible to to be abused. And we we don't do the technology. Most of the time, the science or the technology is neutral, but it depends on the use, right? Again, with the enhancement of humanity, no one know or no one can predict the result of human superhuman biologically. Or we gonna go more on the computer side, on the you know more machines things. So uh, we'll see what's gonna be. So I think I will end the slides and uh, open for the discussions or anything. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, you covered many areas. Uh, you can put your slide uh, back. It's maybe let's see your desktop is very nice. Um, so we covered not just medical genetic services, and you mentioned that you see around 700 patients a year, and you're the single clinical geneticist in the Chibok University Hospital. So it's a serving a large community. Do you think? Uh, medical doctors receive enough genetics training in Thailand, or you, is there still a deficiency? So, in terms of referrals to genetic services, because that was an issue yes. in many Asian countries mm -hmm. in the last few decades. Obviously, we do not have enough genetic trainings, even the healthcare professional, medical professional. 
and it's not only in, in Thailand that we do not have training yet, or just the Asian. Even in the many countries like the U.S., they always have the surveys that uh, the non-genetic specialists do not have enough tools uh, to understand what the genetics can do and not, cannot do. Because as we have more and more genetic tests, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned the clinical tests, but also recreational tests. Many people go to the medical doctor and I don't ask, uh, do you have this test? But even the medical doctors don't know enough about the genetics and about the penetrance of diseases, meaning if you have this genetic uh, mutation, how likely is it going to cause a disease to be expressed as a phenotype? Uh, so in that concept, I think they don't know. So it's quite a dangerous situation, yeah, that we have growing use of consumer-based tests. If I want to get the total genome sequence, can I do it in Thailand or I have to send it to America or Europe? Uh, we do have a machine, so we can do the, you know, the genomes right here in the, in the countries. But uh, as the technology is largely depend on the big scale of you know, the machines and it's very expensive. So we, we have a few, uh, I think less than 10 machines that we can do the genome scale, genome sequencing. So most of the time we'll send out the, the samples to uh, Korea, like some, some, are, some people are already talking about. There's a big sequencing company and also like China, uh, they start to marketing this sequence technology. Yeah. Yes, I, I have been, I spent a couple of days, three days I've spent in BGI in Shenzhen. I, I used to work with Henry Yang and the people in the Genome Project. And they have a very impressive institute, as you mentioned. So they may be using the private market to sell genome testing around Asia. It's interesting. Notes is also trying to test this. Come on, please, and open for discussion. Uh, to one comment, one uh, question. First, one comment in Israel, for example, um, in, in, in the uh, largest uh, medical centers, you have uh, some kind of type of uh, cancer, like uh, lung cancer, for example. You are entitled, and, and, uh, and the state pays for your testing in Foundation One company in the United States for cancer help, and it's covered. And the minute you know what 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 is really your mutation, then then they know how to cover it. And uh, uh, they say it, it it at the end it's cheaper than trying to give you something else. So that's uh, one. That's the comment. The other thing was uh, something that uh, worries me, and uh, it somehow relates to what I was talking about yesterday when all of you were already asleep. But uh, I just. Uh, remind you of that. Uh, I was telling you about uh, uh, cases which used to uh, come to courts all around the world uh, where uh, babies were born uh, imperfect uh, with, uh, with a, a, a real problem. And uh, the problem uh, was not diagnosed by a geneticist while the mother was uh, pregnant, so they couldn't have an abortion and the, the child is born. And now the child sues the gen geneticist uh, for uh, wrongful birth. And uh, the problem is uh, a, a bioethical problem. It's not a legal situation. The, the solution will be legal, uh, but the, the problem is a bioethical problem where first, when do you say that life is not worth living? How defect should the embryo or the, the, the baby be? How defect, so as the court can say that life is not worth living on the one hand, because somebody just said in Israel, maybe now, from now on, everybody will uh, like to have uh, uh, children with blue eyes and, and, and uh, blonde curls. And if you're not like this, then uh, life is not worth living. Uh, eventually, most of the legal system just abolished this, and then uh, you can't now sue uh, your genetics. Uh, 
for this negligence. But uh, this uh, leads me to a question uh, relating to what you are saying. Where do you start fixing people and how, how, how problematic uh, uh, embryo should be so you start fixing what is wrong with it. Uh, if he lacks a finger, do you do something about it or is it not so bad? And when you stop, when, when do you say that the, the baby, the embryo, the baby to be is perfect? I and mean, that's what worries me because uh, the beauty side, who's perfect, whose life is worth living and who's not. Thank you. Uh, so the first uh, part, so we're talking about like the genetic test become more uh, affordable and cheaper and cheaper and then now we can use like the genome uh, of the cancers to decide what the drugs should be done. Uh, and one, one company that she mentioned that uh, the foundation one kind of do all these things. Um, so, uh, so now to so be working on that issues in, in the Thailand situations. So many of the government reimburse for a single genetic test to for single agents. Uh, a few a few agents can be used for the lung cancers, but uh, they they still not going that far to reimburse for like do the genome profiling yet. And I'm really uh, uh, interested in 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 terms of going forward in that because in, in as a lab size actually the genome sequence of the tumor is um, can be done much cheaper than the foundation one do and actually their cost cover is uh, more on the interpretation side of the service uh, that's interesting so uh, regarding like you uh, the topic about and you know what's perfect is perfect or who decide the worth of living uh, actually, in Thailand, in the, by laws, we're not actually doing that uh, practice yet because the law not does not allow we to terminate the babies with genetic conditions or even anything on the childhood conditions. The Thailand law is only allowed that uh, only if it affects maternal health or it's coming from legal, uh, you know, that's uh, the legal part, like, you know, uh, from, I don't know how to say it, uh, the, like uh, from the sexual uh, uh, insult, something like that. So like for the genetic conditions, what in the practice now today, like you, the committees, like the doctors, the couples, the parents, everyone agree that the babies have defect enough in that terms that cause too much burden if they want to keep or not keeping the baby like very common things like Down syndrome, then the physicians or the committees will be okay to doing that. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very fine line to say that who's worth living. Like in the US, actually, like many of the Down syndrome kids born now today, like in, uh, in a country like in Thailand, many of them actually become, you know, terminate or abort if they know that the kids have, have Down syndrome because we do not have really a lot of supportive facility to grow up these kids to be, you know, up to their perfect capacity and potential. So there's a, something playing gods around here in Thailand. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah. okay. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, I'd like to comment something. Uh, I think uh, we can see the beauty of uh, the diversity, diversity on DNA, diversity on uh, different cultures, and, uh, and uh, perspective uh, related to manipulate or not DNA in English, because some countries have uh, restricted, um, or should I say, more than law, but uh, uh, moral restriction to some manipulations. And uh, the beauty is that we, we have several people doing several things in several places. So how can we uh, can uh, control? I think we cannot control, but anyway, uh, 
how to deal with this uh, diversity. It's one point. How to deal with this uh, diversity in several levels, uh, material level, spiritual level, moral and the uh, lower level. So uh, I think uh, uh, the main issue is facing this, these differences, trying to minimize the, the harm to uh, the humanity. I'm just thinking about the humanity, not about uh, uh, isolated uh, people or isolated individuals, and more a concern about uh, humanity. In the, First thing. The second comment is about the Gattaca. It's more philosophical than uh, technical moving because the guy uh, who was concepted by the faith uh, was more successful than the other that was perfect. And uh, I, I think there was a kind of manipulation. He was a perfect person. But he had an accident, caught an accident. I think he tried to kill himself, the, the perfect guy that was supposed to go to the, the space. So they substitute him. So uh, it, it, uh, for me, it is the best argument against determinism, genetics determinism. Because what you have in your genome will not be introduced in your life or you will not uh, be introduced in more successful or not life. And um, I'd like to you comment on those two things because I know that, I know, well, I can first, uh, uh, I can see that uh, physicians are not that concerned about the genetic um, stuff, I mean, how the genes uh, interact, because you have the penetrance, but you have uh, some interaction between uh, adults, or then you have interaction between uh, genes, so you have interaction between parts of genome, enhancing parts that uh, uh, enhance a, a gene function, uh, sometimes using um, RNA siding to uh, 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 DNA, it's better than editing DNA. So, would you like, uh, I'd like to you comment to those two points? Thank you. Yeah. So, so the first part about the diversity, uh, yes, it's really important as you know, as as a practitioners. So you have to palettes and learns about you know those diversities in terms of what they think, what they believe, their cultural belief, and it's very challenging and very complex. And many times I I cannot handle it by myself, and we need the teams that are coming out for have a lot of inputs from every angle or perspective. Especially like you know when we talk about it, if we need to terminate the, the pregnancy, it's involved tons of people was involved from the psychological part, legally legal part. Uh, one thing that I think that in, in, in Thailand or in many nations country that we, we do not take uh, some spiritual uh, diversity into account. I mean, in Thailand, it's, we, we thought it would be a very homogeneous in terms of like many people identify themselves with this from birth. Uh, so as when the doctors practice and the generals, I think they will think about them in, in terms of like you know, what's the uh, lay people like lay Buddhists will think about that, and sometimes they forget that you know their their religious belief or their cultural belief is so much different. Uh, when I was practiced uh, or trained in the U.S., that I I kind of impressed that they have all kind of like the spiritual teams that come come into the account, and then sometimes like you know it's very interesting. Like in Thailand, like I, I would say like as a doctor, you have some status that the patients or family really. You know, uh, sometimes we call it worship to you, 
uh, as like we said, like very paternalistic. But when I was in the state, and then when we talk about with the spiritual teams and the medical team, and then the patient and the family turns to the spiritual teams to listen and discuss with them like deeper, and then we can touch on that issue. So that's I, I agree that it's very beautiful in terms of the diversity in the genetics or in the, in the, what they believe or thinking about that. Uh, and then talk of, talking about the Kataka, I, I, I do agree that uh, uh, in the details, I, I didn't talk much about the plots. So the guys, the, the, acting, the acting role is the genetics inferior, and then the other guys who is the genetic perfect and about to go to the, you know, the Saturns uh, in the spaceship. Uh, but he, he, he have a very good genetics and he uh, become the second in the, in the uh, athlete competitive, something like that. So he decided to suicide, kill myself, to, to, uh, jump into the, uh, hit by the car. And uh, finally, um, this show, as, as she mentioned, that it's, it's really the things about that, I don't know, that many people will get from these movies that it's really talking about the genetic determinism. Right? So uh, you have good genes, but you don't know a lot of that interaction. You don't, and social force, families, uh, like uh, social force, like in this case, the first one maybe always have been, to, you know, being compared to his younger brothers that he's genetically inferior. So that's maybe one of the, you know, the motive that he start to get over and past these genetic barriers. Uh, so we we have to educate the public about these things because of many I think the lay public is more concerned about the genetic determinants. Most of them will say like yes or no, you have this and you you you're gonna have this come out. And the ideas of the penetrance or the gene gene interaction, the social interaction is it's very difficult to grasp like in this clinical setting. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much, uh, Prasad. It's been a most informative uh, introduction to the views of a clinical geneticist and the practice and of uh, your background in bioethics as well. Very pleased to hear that. So we have uh, one more presentation uh, from Sari, who is going to talk about uh, medical genetics and her perspectives from Canada and from her experience. Resilient is that we have 
is our genetic diversity. Um, and there isn't one form of, there's, there's multiple forms of, of a gene that can be considered healthy. And we tend to standardize that. So if we do go through with gene editing, is that going to become standardized and result in decreased genetic diversity among their species? That was, that was a pretty huge concern about that. Um, yeah. And there were also concerns about acceptance of germline gene editing for research because there were, it was multiple times presented an interesting idea about, because um, as you said, UK is going forward with trying to establish germline gene editing for research purposes. And there were concerns that doesn't that imply, because, because of how limited, um, our, even if you do perform research on it, it is quite limited because it's pre-implantation. And so the, um, the growth and development, which is the, the biggest unknown about gene editing, we would, we would remain an unknown if we only do research pre-implantation. Um, but if we accept germline gene editing for research, saying uh, research, it's also implying that we're willing to accept that risk once we perfected the research pre-implantation. Um, so that was a question that was addressed uh, quite often as well. Um, so I, I was curious to compare that with general public and also with genetic professionals in their views. And with surveys of general public in the States, I chose it because it's North America, I thought it would be more similar. Uh, there were similar acceptance of somatic and um, germline gene editing for medical conditions. Um, when, but in, among genetic professionals, there were about half the acceptance for germline gene editing uh, for both basic research and clinical research, respectively. Um, which uh, which is which was interesting because the, the students seem to be less accepting of germline gene editing than genetic professionals who are um, working with it on a daily basis. Um, so, but then also level of knowledge about gene editing seems to be influencing ethical perspectives, um, uh, even among uh, the general public. So there was a study in Japan where. They rank people's knowledge of gene editing into three groups, and then uh, they ask them various questions. And there's a high acceptance with more understanding of the technology in, in both, uh, and they did it both with general public and patients. And then there was also the study in the states, and they saw that the more the knowledge about gene editing, the more likely to be in favor of both editing for medical condition, and they also saw it for enhancement. Um, so. I, so I became interested in this because I was volunteering for the Canadian Rare Disease Organization and I had someone, uh, I would get asked a lot of questions about genetics um, from other parent volunteers and I also found out that they received questions like that quite often through email um, and, and even written letters that they would get. And so I became a liaison between them and the Canadian Association for Genetic Counselors. Uh, to get their help in answering a lot of these questions because the professionals they had a lot of times weren't well equipped to answer um, some of those questions. And a lot of it, is there were questions about gene testing for, um, for diagnosis, but there were also a lot of questions about gene editing for the purpose of treatment and possibility of treatment. And they would even go as far as to ask that about their <coughs> grand grandchildren's and next generations. And, um, in the beginning, they would email me these questions and I would try to find the right genetic counselor to email that question, sort of forward the email to you and get them to answer it. Um, and from a lot of those questions, I think questions are a great way to sort of, to, to see how much people understand and what their concerns are about an issue. And from those questions, I learned a couple of things. One was that there was a lot of misconceptions. There were a lot of factually incorrect statements from which they were building a lot of the questions on. Um, and there was also a study in Japan that showed out of uh, respondents who indicated, I understand what gene editing means, 24% uh, and 24% uh, of the general public and 31% of the patient respect uh, incorrectly answered uh, simple true and false questions about um, basics of gene editing and CRISPR after that. Um, I also learned there was, there, 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 there was a lot of interest not uh, just from people affected and their immediate families, but also from like quite far extended families or even extended family members of carriers uh, of a disease that had never manifested in their in their families. Um, 
that, that was interesting. And also I realized there's no one equipped to answer their questions because they're so far <coughs> removed from that that they could not take their questions to anyone, uh, any, any professional. Uh, and also there's this incredible optimism about how quickly we're going to get these technologies and, and, and that they're going to be able to use them. Um, and that there was this, and from all of that, I realized there was this real lack of an interactive forum where they could ask questions um, to learn about genetic counseling and genetic editing and treatment, as opposed to just being, as opposed to just data and written articles and videos. Um, and also, I think I, their questions could usually generally be divided into two groups. One was the technical questions and speculative questions. The technical questions were like, is gene therapy permanent? Can it be reversed? Is there a gene therapy for so-and-so disease? Uh, what is the difference between cell therapy and gene therapy? What type of genetic defects are easier to change? Um, they're not without their difficulty explaining, usually because you have to refer to a lot of background science and technological data. Um, but but they're, really, they're, they're quite straightforward, because you just have to present the information to them. But then there were also these speculative questions about when would this therapy become available? Could my kids, grandkids, gen I had someone who went three or four gen I think three, three generations back asking the questions. Um, and will germline uh, gene therapy become, become legal soon? Um, so some social legal questions as well. And to, to answer these, to, uh, and I, I would also be able to read the answers that genetic counselors would give to these questions, and to answer them, they usually had to, um, they were forced to use ambiguous terms, because if someone asks you, when would these ter gene therapy become available, you can't say never, because it could, become, it could become available, but you also can't give a definite timeline, so it results in answers like, I hope, uh, we hope in the near future, or, um, in the next couple of decades, um, and actually, I, I was in, uh, out of my own curiosity, I asked around a couple of people what they, if, if I asked you that an asteroid is going to hit the Earth and it's going to destroy it in a couple of decades, do you assume that's going to be in your lifetime or not? Um, and most people said that they assume it's going to be in their lifetime, but uh, I, might, I might also be biased because I was asking a quite younger uh, crowd, but. It, it's an interesting to think about, and also I think people perceive it differently. If, I, if they, they're told that there's going to be a cure in decades, some people think it's in their lifetime, and it could change their decisions about their life quite drastically. Um, yeah, um, but so these questions were po these questions were answered by genetic counselors, but were posed to this organization. So I was wondering if um, genetic counselors get these questions from their patients as well. Um, so I asked. I asked around some genetic counselors, um, and almost all of them said that they do. They have gotten questions, at least a handful of questions of their, in, during their time. Uh, but some interesting trends were that in larger cities, they seem to be getting a lot more questions and a lot more serious questions about about them, because some are getting questions like um, examples like. Um, I heard about this thing CRISPR, so you're going to start cutting up our genes, which is, which is not a very serious question about, about their medical condition. But in, especially there were, there were, there were, um, there were there's a neonatal geneticist in San Francisco who said she gets questions about it on a daily basis. And they assume it's already happening, and they're, they're, their question is usually, where can I get it? How can I get it? Why don't I have it? Um, which are a lot more serious questions. Um, and the, the other interesting thing was the prenatal genetic counselors were getting asked way more questions about gene editing um, than other types of genetic counselors. And it's just an assumption, but it could be because they see that their, their child, their offspring, has a longer lifespan. They, they see it as a possibility more so than maybe a cancer geneticist. Um, so I don't have access to my notes. I think I missed some other things, but um, so genetic counselors do get some do get training on being really thoughtful and creative about how they answer answer the question, especially when it comes to um, risk um, evaluating someone's risk and communicating that knowledge um, by like not just using percentage, using five and a hundred, and then using. Uh, ten, and a, ten and a thousand, and different different examples until and they ask questions and make it interactive for to make sure that their patient understands. 
And, but even though they, they have this extensive training on communicating rest and, and in other areas, there is no specific training on how to answer questions about gene editing. And I spoke to a few, uh, I spoke to a professor at U of T and also at McGill who teach genetic counseling. Um, they confirmed that because I couldn't find anything on that. But there is a paper that, is, that was recently published called Counsel uh, Counseling After CRISPR. And it poses questions about um, like under what medical circumstances might it be appropriate for a prenatal genetic counselor to raise the possibility of a genetic intervention. Um, they're, they're really great questions that would become, would become part of a genetic counselor's reality if genetic, genetic therapy becomes a, an effective, accepted norm. Um, and, it, and it's great that we're asking these questions already, but it, it is for the, but, but it, it's not a problem quite yet. But what is a problem is even if there is no situation in which a genetic counselor is obligated to, uh, to, to explain a gene therapy or to suggest that, um, there are cases where they're, they're asked questions. And if they're asked questions, they have to address it. Um, and it might seem benign, but there, there are cases where it can, it can get it can have quite a lot of consequence. And one of that is, um, for example, if in a prenatal genetic screening, um, a, an, a child, an unborn fetus, um, tests positive for a life-threatening or life-debilitating uh, condition. Um, and in that situation, the genetic counselor is obligated to discuss termination as a possibility with that. Uh, but, in, as these questions that he poses, they are not obligated at this point to discuss gene therapy because they're not available. But what if the family asks them about gene therapy and its possibility? And what if the disease, the, the, the debilitating <laughs> disease, is a late onset disease for which the family can have hope that in the future, when this actually becomes a problem, by then there could be a, there could be a solution. Now, if a passive statement that a genetic counselor makes say in decades um, or hopefully in the near future, um, the way the families interpret that could, could have significant effect on their decision making. Um, some things to think about. And these are some of the questions that I'm interested in and I wanted to conclude with, is, which is in public engagement and ethical discussions on gene editing, is it important to make sure that there is an accurate knowledge transfer of the science? Um, and should ambiguous language be avoided when explaining uncertainty? Or is that room for interpretation of positive because it leaves, uh, it leaves it up to them to make that decision? Uh, so when this is so for, if a genetic counselor says in decades, they're not lying. It is, it, decades could be anywhere from 20 to 90 years and it's, and it's their estimate. And anyone should be allowed to make that estimation. So it's sort of empowering um, the families and the people making that decision by giving them that room to interpret. And is providing knowledge about gene therapy as an emerging treatment beneficial to patients? Uh, and when is a course of treatment promising enough to be discussed with patients? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, um, yeah, e excellent. And so you did the course in genetics in Canada that you did is for four years or three, three years? Four years. Four years. And what does it require to be licensed to do genetic counseling on your own? Okay. You can assist or you need to some other certification? Or? It's, it's a two-year master's program. And there is a, there's a written board exam for it. In, in, in Canada, US, Australia, UK. Right. Okay. okay, that's good. And so, how do you think uh, is the general genetic literacy in Canada? Do you think people understand these questions, like you're asking the students, do they really understand the difference between somatic and germline? Or what do you think? Between students. Yeah, for students. For students, yeah, definitely. Because it's, it's part of what we study. Um, but, uh, I. 
yeah, among public, it seemed to be, I was very surprised to find, even like smaller cities just outside of Toronto, how much they got asked the question was significantly different than bigger cities, Toronto, Montreal. Yeah. And did you see any ethnic differences in the responses, or was it big enough sample? Yeah, I didn't ask that far, yeah. yeah. But um, the Canadian Genetic Council Association is looking into doing a survey, a more extensive survey on that. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? And also, what about do your students in genetics ask about these sorts of questions to? They are just Brazil? concerned about the, the final test. <laughs> no, I'm just coming. Come. <laughs> she teaches genetics in Brazil, and I wonder what it's like. Um, because in your course, you would teach about bioethics, but is that common? In, no, I, I teach bioethics for some courses in genetics, for other courses. For the, the courses I teach uh, genetics, they are more concerned about understanding the function uh, of the genes and uh, how uh, things happen in the cell. So they, they are not concerned about the new therapies they I, I, it might be a, a fault we have at the university a lot of things to do and uh, you can even see the, the TV so they are not very familiar. They have no questions about uh, gene uh, therapy or heredity. But the people who uh, study bioethics, they are more concerned about uh, manipulation uh, but they are, they, they are more um, Discussions about uh, we have no possibility to use like uh, those technologies, so they uh, are more mature. At the end of the course, they are uh, at the bioethics uh, discipline, so they have the idea that it's not uh, for nowadays to use these uh, technologies, but just discuss and to to see how would be the best way to use in the future if it was to be kind of a set about this using. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, Daniel, please come. Uh, just to show to the dark, I liked very much what you said about the age differences in, in perspective of how we, how we perceive uh, future risks because I found myself changing, going through changing perceptions because uh, environmental and now uh, well, I put it, bioethical threats uh, suddenly, in recent years, seemed much more urgent than they seemed before. And I just started looking through such topics. And I was wondering, I mean, you're much younger than I am, but still I was wondering how do you perceive such threats as you were discovered? As Far in the future or quite near? Health threats? I, well, or, or threats from, from genome research, it could be environmental uh, threats. I, I mean, we should remember that I, I, mean, I was going all the morning with a mask on my face. Mm -hmm. and I guess more than 50% of the people in the streets were going with masks on their faces. And I was first in Bangkok in 1994, and I was horrified by the air pollution. I could actually see it. And 98, it was just as bad. And then it seemed to, get, to be getting better. And now it's much worse. So this is my perspective. I, the apocalypse that was visible in 94 is suddenly here. So maybe you can reflect on this more about this, the 
a time uh, parameter for your perspective, a little more. My, my personal perspective on how um, I think you're generally pretty optimistic when you're young um, about these things and you don't think of health concerns as, a, as much. Um, yeah. Maybe you believe the system more? Probably, yeah. Maybe also because I know the science isn't isn't quite here yet. It doesn't feel like an imminent threat, like something we should think about and prepare for in the future, but not a not an imminent threat in my in my life. That means you're young. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I feel old. Still, still young, Daniel. Any other comments or questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Sarah. It's very thank you. And I think this morning's session we had a <coughs> active discussion of gene editing and genetic screening in practice. Uh, it's interesting that a film like Gattaca talked about uh, more genetic screening and determinism rather than uh, gene editing and genetic engineering. But there were different movies who did that, and I think by focusing on that determinism aspect, it made a strong point, and that's why it's so strongly recommended uh, for watching in, uh, in different countries. I have in my bioethics texts uh, exercises based on many movies, and Gannica is one of them. Um, and it's uh, interesting, because we have other, as you mentioned, now even series on uh, uh, Netflix and so on. Okay, well, thank you very much to a uh, good day's morning session. We're going to have lunch now, and we'll be back in an hour's time. Thank you.